An African king, the Emir of Katsina in northern Nigeria, rides out from his palace for the annual parade and festival called the Salah at the end of the Muslim fast of Ramadan. The idea of kingship as a means of tackling the problems of government is as old and established in Africa as in any other continent. Surrounded by his bodyguards and by troops of loyal followers, the king receives the allegiance of his people. The king no longer has any real political power, but he is the traditional ruler of an ancient city and kingdom of the Hausa, one of many African peoples who built their own organized states over the past thousand years. Kings need to display their wealth, and if they're wise, they also provide entertainment. But above all, kings need to display their power and authority in ways that are clear to everyone. The Sala is also a political event. Even today, this is more than a mere display. It's an act of recognition. The king is accompanied by royal guards in the finery of an ancient military tradition. Some have equipment and body armor that seem to go back to long lost Christian Nubia and even to the time of the Crusades. All now await the ritual act of allegiance by the lesser chiefs of Katsina, the Jaffi. Wave upon wave, in a gesture which is part threatening and part submissive, the district heads salute their master. <laughs> of course, there is a great deal more in history than the drama of kings and queens. A lot of African peoples found it easy, and indeed better, to do without royal masters. Yet kingship clearly remained an important part of the story, and the facts of Africa's historical development reveal a wide variety of kingdoms and empires. Most of the old kingdoms have vanished long since, and all the old empires, but some of them have left behind, for us, magnificent reminders of their majesty and power. This astonishing sculpture in gleaming copper represents one of the rulers, or Oni, of the Kingdom of Ife in western Nigeria seven or eight centuries ago. And yet when these superb sculptures first came to the attention of Europeans, only as recently as 1910, the experts at once pronounced that Africans could never have conceived or made them and that some wandering European must have been the artist. Now the world knows better. The truth is that these are portraits of African kings made by African artists for use in royal ceremonial. South from Ife and near the coast, there flourished the ancient city and empire of Benin. This old print, following a Dutchman's visit in about 1620, shows the king of Benin riding out to receive the plaudits of his people. 
The Nin artists, beginning at least as early as 1400, had long been developing their own styles and techniques, styles that were entirely African in inspiration and execution. They have their place today among the artistic masterpieces of the world. This ivory armlet places the king where he belonged in Benin society at the center of all things. Plaques in brass, which once adorned the walls of the Orbers Palace, reinforce the power and mystery of the king. A visitor from Holland to the King of Benin in about 1600 wrote this report. The city is composed of 30 main streets, very straight and wide. The houses are arranged in good order. The people are in no way inferior to the Dutch in cleanliness. Their houses are as polished as a looking glass. They have good laws and efficient police and show us a thousand marks of friendship. Orba, king of men, could handle leopards, the kings of the forest, like toys. From his waist sprang mudfish, symbols of power over sea and river, whose guardian was Olicum, archangel of the waters. The king had great authority, but this depended on the support of noblemen and appointed chiefs, and on certain persons of ritual power. Among these were the Queen Mothers of Benin, one of whom is shown in this memorable head, sculpted in about 1550. Adjoining Benin was the ancient empire of the Yoruba people, with its heart in the city of Oyo. The Yoruba developed great military strength based on cavalry. In matters of state, the King of Oyo had to consult his council, the Oyo Macy. If the council were united against him, the king was in trouble. In theory, he was supreme, whether in religious affairs or secular matters. But if he lost the confidence of the Oyo Messi, he could even face death. Such was the authority of the council that if they turned against him, the king might have to commit suicide. So kingly power in old Africa was a two-edged sword, and rulers had to use it with care. When at last Europeans reached these shores, they came at first in peace, as traders or ambassadors asking favors. The king could grant trading permits, which he did in return for handsome gifts. Great deference was shown by these European visitors, and many accounts speak with admiration of the splendor of African kings, their courts and their palaces. The cities, too, were large and impressive enough to command European respect. This was certainly true of the Hauser city of Kano, painted here by the German traveler Heinrich Barth during a visit in 1851. The Hauser people lived in a cluster of independent states north of the junction of the Niger and Benue rivers. Each state had its own capital, like Katsina or Kano. Kano today is one of the major cities of modern Nigeria, and like most of our world, has lost some of its reverence for kingly power, smothered beneath the motor cars and the main roads. But Kano still has some vestiges of its ancient dignity 
including parts of the old city wall. Restored and preserved behind metal barricades, some of the old gates still pierce